Well, when I was asked to uh, talk about native plants, um, this was kind of a, a, a topic that's close to my heart. I, I liked natives before natives were cool. Uh, we started our nursery 20 years ago, and we thought that the world was ready for pawpaws and persimmons and things like that, so we ordered a bunch of little one-gallon plants and brought in all these really, what I thought were cool natives, but nobody came and bought them. Um, we had small trees, everybody wanted big trees. Uh, we tried all this stuff back in the, the mid to late 90s and it just really wasn't time for Kentuckians to, to come out and, and buy natives and talk about natives. Of course, we've been growing oak trees and maple trees and, and the really um, uh, mainstream natives forever and ever, but the, the whole native push has really come around and coming on strong over the past five or six years with the advent of all the butterfly and pollinator talk. Uh, so we're really poised to, to kind of help people find native plants and it's, it is really a lot of fun to be able to reintroduce people to plants that have been growing around their neighborhoods, around their cities and parks. Uh, and out in the, the wild areas for, for eons. Uh, but it's, it's fun to reintroduce people to those and actually help get these into uh, managed landscapes. Because a lot of native plants are very, very difficult to put into a traditional landscape. Uh, they're not going to adapt the way that a lot of our customers want them to. So I tried to choose 20 plants that that aren't going to get you um, uh, condemna condemnation notices from your from your neighborhood. Uh, a lot of people that stop mowing their, their lawns really have problems with their neighbors and with the city. Uh, so we're not talking about plants that are just going to let uh, get to go wild and take over uh, you know your whole garden area or your whole neighborhood. Um, but things that, that I've had success with over the years that are native, uh, I think all of these are technically native to Kentucky. Uh, if not, they're southeastern natives. I think we have a couple that aren't technically native to our area. But I tried to choose things that are going to help us as landscape uh, professionals solve problems. And that's what, what the committee asked me to talk about. So I divided this up into four problem uh, areas that, that that all of us encounter in our daily lives for the most part. Uh, this one was my favorite spot, is a wet soil, heavy clay. Uh, this is one that has gained a lot of popularity uh, with the advent of rain gardens. So there are a lot of really nice native uh, Kentucky plants that will adapt very well to wet, heavy clay soils and that could also be integrated into uh, manageable rain gardens. Um, one of my favorite trees, which is quite adaptable not just to wet sites, but also to very dry upland sites, is the common bald cypress uh, taxodium. When we started the nursery and garden center 20 years ago, we had very heavy clay soil we had some pretty good, decent uh, pasture soil where the tobacco fields and things were, but by the time we got finished doing all the earth moving and grading, it was he heavily compacted and fairly clay. So I wanted to have trees that were going to be able to tolerate clay and daily watering because when you have a garden center or a nursery, you're putting a lot of water to the ground if you've got clay soils. Um, it's going to stay pretty wet. So we positioned three really big, well actually they were little back then, maybe two inch size trees, but they were right in the heart of our, our retail area. And, and these are the trees now. I mean, it, there's not a day that the bald cypress don't look cool. They're just awesome trees, winter, spring, summer, or fall. Uh, we are starting to experience one of the problems with bald cypress now. You've got these little knees that pop up wherever you've got standing water. And this is one of our little stream areas, and the knees are just taking taking this area by storm. So this, all of our trees on the site, are, they, they're not any older, they haven't been there for any longer than 19 years pretty much, maybe 20 years if we planted them right when we started. But we didn't really start planting things until the, the, the fall of 95. These probably went in in the spring of 96 as a two inch size tree and now they're probably you know, maybe 18, 24 inches across and probably 30, 
maybe 40 feet tall now. So they're incredibly fast growing on the right sites. So uh, the places that they like the best would be lots of water. Um, so if you've got really poorly drained, heavy, heavy soils and you want a fast growing shade tree and you can deal with the knee situation, uh, bald cypress might be a good choice for you. Um, we've planted these on sites from wet to dry and for the most part they they get started kind of slowly uh, I always tell my customers if you want to water something water the bald cypress you cannot overwater that tree now if you don't water it very much it's just it could possibly just sit there for years and years and years they don't seem to like to transplant very well it's better in my opinion to start with them a little bit smaller um, so don't spec these as three and a half four inch trees unless they're going into really well-watered, really low-lying areas where they're going to have lots of moisture, where they're going to really be able to kind of regenerate that, that loss of roots. Um, but it is a great, great tree. Another tree that we started with in our garden center area, although we didn't start with it in this particular spot, which is kind of in a little um, corner of our shade structures, we started out in the open of the garden center um, about 15 feet from, a, from the, one of those three bald cypress. So it wasn't a very good spot, but when you're starting out and you have no shade and you're trying to get shade because you're, you're, your new customers or, or complaining of how hot it is out there. We put maybe more trees a little closer together than we should have. So about five years after this tree was, was growing, we moved it into its current location. Um, so this tree in this spot has been there probably 10, 12 years now about 20 25 feet tall this is a swamp white oak quercus bicolor another very adaptable native oak species so if you've got a spot that you can't really figure out why everything else is dying uh, whether it's really heavy uh, wet soils under underneath the surface or something that tends to dry out a little bit when it starts getting into the summer you know this has been a, a really adaptable tree across a wide variety of, of, of situations but if you've got a, a heavy clay soil, um, try swamp white oak. Uh, it doesn't have the beautiful fall color that, that Paul was talking about uh, with, the, with the scarlet oak, um, but it's got such a sturdy um, kind of macho outline. It's got this great uh, peely bark, uh, really sturdy branch structure. Um, and just good strong growth. The leaves are very velvety underneath, very thick and glossy on the top. So it is a wonderful shade tree um, for any kind of, of tough site. How many of you all are growing swamp white oak or have used it? A few of you. Pretty good across the boards as far as wherever you've put it. You happy with its performance? I, I think it's a, a great tree. Um, some of the shrubs that are, have really made it into the mainstream. I remember probably 20 years ago seeing Henry's Garnet sweet spire and we thought this was such an unusual shrub because it was coloring up holding its leaves so late beautiful kind of burgundy fall color well into november and december and nobody knew what it was and it's a it's an american native uh, so it's pretty much out there now everywhere um, and it's very adaptable to, to upland situations drier sites and very low-lying soggy spots i'd like to see these integrated more into rain gardens and other areas like that, drainage areas, just because it is such a nice uh, native plant with a great uh, showy spring bloom, very attractive to, to many pollinators and butterflies, uh, and the fall color is, is spectacular on it too. Lots of cultivars besides Henry's Garnet. You've got Little Henry's. Um, I haven't been as happy with a lot of the other newer varieties or, or maybe other ones that have been introduced haven't seen that they've been quite as vigorous as the straight species and the two Henry variety. So I, I typically stick with those instead of Saturnalia and all these other ones, Merlot and some of these that I've actually put into the landscape and, and had very poor uh, success with them. So um, I would stick with Henry's Garnet, Little Henry and the straight species and try them in part sun, part shade. I think that's going to be their sweet spot and places where they do get quite a bit of moisture. I think they're going to look their best. 
Another native that's kind of, you know, it's out there, it's very available, uh, but I've had trouble getting these established in landscape jobs, and that's one of the reasons that kind of keeps me from, from um, really promoting it more, but in a low-lying wet spot, I think you're going to have more luck. Um, where I've had trouble with them is customers that don't do a very good job watering and these plants are coming in in a really loose soil mix. You're planting them usually in summer when they're blooming and they just wilt down very quickly. Uh, I've seen these die very quickly if they don't get enough water. They're just not that adaptable until they get established. I've seen the same plant on hikes in the gorge, totally dense, dark shade, no water, doing beautifully, I mean, not quite as beautiful as what you're seeing in the pictures, but surviving and doing well. I think once it's established, it's going to do much better. But getting it there with a lot of your customers, if they don't have irrigation, if they're not good at watering, this is going to be a hard sell. But if you situate this in a rain garden area where you're going to be getting that water, uh, in a, a, a well-irrigated site, I think you're going to have good luck with Clethra um, or Summer Sweet or Sweet Pepper Bush. There's lots of, of names on it. Uh, one of the other problems with this plant is when it does start blooming, it coincides within the Japanese beetles and the June beetles. June bugs are coming in, so they do love these sweet smelling flowers and that's not real attractive for some folks that don't want to see things that eat that the beetles will eat. Um, beetles don't typically, from my experience, don't um, eat the foliage too much, but they just go all over the flowers. So that could be a problem for certain landscapes, but um, the flowers do attract all kinds of, of pollinating insects and butterflies. So it's great for anyone with a natural uh, landscape that's trying to promote, um, you know, help the native of bees and, and flies and wasps and all the other native pollinators. Uh, lots of great cultivars out there uh, from 16 candles to um, sugar tina. Uh, there's all kinds of, of um, you know, hummingbird. Lots of different white cultivars as well as plenty of, of pink, light pink and deep pink varieties. So look for this one. Um, especially where you can put it in that wet soil situation. Great fall color, good clean foliage all season long, and even the, the seed pods, uh, even though they're not totally um, maybe ornamental, they don't detract. Uh, they stay clean and neat. Uh, you could go out here and deadhead it um, if you wanted to, but, but um, you don't really have to. Um, pretty nice native shrub for, for lots of different situations. This is a plant that I've been very impressed with over the past uh, seven, eight years. I never really thought too much about turtle head. Um, I don't even know really how to say that Latin name. I think it's uh, supposed to be said Chiloni, but I say Shiloni sometime and Shalone and Shilone and Shiloni. I usually just call it turtle head. Um, this one is probably my favorite out of all the different turtle head varieties. It's called Hot Lips. And who doesn't love Hot Lips? Um, this is a little area right um, by our landscape office, so I pass this plant every day. And we've got this, it, in most years it's a wet weather spring that, that flows out of the hillside, comes down and runs under our front room in our office kind of like a falling water kind of uh, appearance. Uh, not a whole lot of flowing water, but it's always damp right down in here. And probably about six, seven years ago, we threw this uh, turtle head down into the mud. It's pretty, always pretty much muddy. This year it's been wet from, gosh, from January until it's still wet right now. Usually it dries out a little bit in June and July and August. But this thing, um, dark, lustrous foliage, lots of these spikes with these really cool um, pink flowers that do look like, like snapping turtle heads. So it's a great native plant for wet areas. So if you're doing rain gardens, um, 
even just a little basin by where a downspout empties and you're trying to catch your, your, the water for a client or something before it runs out into the gutter. Really cool plant. Here I've combined it with um, one of the native uh, hibiscus that doesn't get gigantic and doesn't have the huge platter shaped flowers. This is just hibiscus, I think, lasiocarpus, um, which is just a nice combination with a soft pink and a little bit more uh, hot pink uh, for mid-June all the way. It's still blooming right now. So this has been probably five to six weeks that the turtle heads are blooming. So it's a really unusual uh, native plant that's quite readily available. Another one that Paul was talking about, and I'm glad to see it on the, the Theodore Klein plant list. This is one, again, that took me a while to really warm up to it. Um, it's Cephalanthus, and when you get them in in the spring, the plants look completely dead, and you might call your, your, your grower and tell them, gosh, you sent me some dead plants, they just don't look very good. It gets started so late that this thing that's in this pot with one stick on it, it's just like, is this thing really going to do something? Um, that's the, the true native ones. Now the cultivar ones have been bred to be thicker, denser plants. If you fertilize them a lot, they're going to be fuller. A lot of our native customers don't really want a lot of fertilizer. They want the plants that haven't been pushed uh, to their limits. So they're wanting plants that don't have pesticides, don't have chemical fertilizers. So they're not going to be typically the retail ready plants that most of us are used to in the nursery industry. So you have to be sensitive to that if you're trying to gain that native uh, clientele. Uh, and we're right now experiencing kind of an interesting dichotomy of our customers where we've got our native plant section where we don't use any pesticides or as few as, actually we don't use any in the native plant section, but it doesn't really look like a tr traditional garden center and a lot of people come in there and go wow what are you doing with all these weeds on the tables and why does it look like this and they're not looking at that at all and they're going right to where you've got all the tables with the, the plants and nice and dense and full and all in full bloom and obviously they've had some fertilizers and uh, we still try not to have any chemicals but it's really hard to know if all your suppliers are what they're putting on their plants but now we've got almost as many people coming and looking at natives as we do looking at you know the rose bushes on in full bloom so it's really pretty interesting and and getting those two to kind of mix and mingle uh, so that you've got people on both sides of the of the equation um, this one right now with some of the newer cultivars like moonlight fantasy and and sputnik and some of these are is going to start making the transition i think into the typical homeowner landscape now especially once they start saying wow this is a really interesting plant they don't really buy it because it's a native, they're buying it because it's interesting. It has a cool foliage, it has a cool flower. Uh, and yes, people are asking for plants now for just butterflies and pollinators. So it's really a, this one on all counts is pretty interesting. Um, it is one too that I've had trouble though establishing in different sites. It just seems like it's a slow starter. Anybody else recognize that with button bush or do you plant them and they just take off? It, I've had them in the landscape for three or four years and they just look like they're dying and finally all of a sudden, and this was the, the in, in a sinkhole area that we have uh, where we have our certified Monarch way station. We put these in about four or five years ago in, a, in an area where the water all drains down into it. I thought it would be perfect for them and they still just sat there and sat there and sat there. About two years ago they took off and this is inside that sinkhole area and it's not never fills up with water but it's got water at its at its disposal um, but I like Paul's comment um, that this will take hot dry baking um, conditions and then it's I'm more familiar seeing it along pond edges partial shade uh, and this kind of is closer to that situation but done beautifully and now I just love seeing the flowers the seed pods 
the lustrous leaves, and they're finally taken off after, it took about four or five years. So it is one that you can hopefully educate your customers on and start using it now in those spots where it may be a, a tough situation. Um, I'm not sure that you'll be able to use this along parking lot um, it, medians and things, but certainly along the edges of parking lots or uh, larger buildings and things like that, because typically this is going to get, uh, I, I know the ones at the Arboretum are 10, 12, 15 foot tall. It becomes kind of a big, almost like a, a red twig dogwood outline kind of thing, but this would be a lot more interesting than, uh, and you wouldn't have to cut it back every, you know, thin it out every three years or something like that. Um, another one that I've had great luck with, didn't really know this plant very much. It's in the, in the uh, has been in the um, industry for a long, long time. There's lots of different types of obedient plants. And I really haven't found any that I don't like, but they do bloom at very different times depending upon what the cultivars are. Um, this one is one I think is called Vivid. I've lost, long lost the tags and the tags are, tag is down in there somewhere, but it's such a, a good, assertive kind of native plant for clay soils. This is out close to one of our, um, in the middle of one of our rain gardens um, by the gazebo. And it just is a low-lying area, heavy, heavy clay. And this thing has just done great. This is blooming right now with these really beautiful, spiky, snapdragon-like flowers. Very clean foliage. Now, a lot of times when we're talking about native plants, we really want insects, native insects, and native animals and birds to, to eat these things. So that's another thing that's a little hard to get used to when you've been um, indoctrinated into the typical nursery landscape garden center world. You don't want plants that get eaten. But when you're in the real world and you're trying to promote natives, you want plants to get eaten. Well, this one doesn't really feed a lot of plants, but it, it's great for pollinating insects. So there's a lot of native bees and butterflies and things that are going to really love this plant. Uh, and it does give you a long season of bloom. So again, if you're doing rain gardens or have a customer that wants uh, something for a low-lying area, you might try obedient plant. Another one that's really, seems like it's getting a lot more press these days uh, is Joe Pie Weed, which is the uh, very commonly seen roadside weed, especially when you get outside of the, the, the inner bluegrass. It's, I don't see this too often growing wild here in central Kentucky, but you go out towards the gorge, uh, towards Powell County or something, it's all along the roadsides in the ditches. I'm sure it's on the way to Western Kentucky too. Uh, loves it, low-lying, damp areas, but a lot of people can't, don't have the room for regular old Joe Pye that gets, he can get 15 feet tall. It's really cool, but you don't have, a lot of people don't have room for that. So now there's a lot of new cultivars. There's Baby Joe, um, which is supposed to be the smallest one. There's Little Joe. From my experience, my Baby Joe that's down here in our lowest rain garden, it seems like it's getting taller than, than um, Little Joe. Uh, and, and Baby Joe has, seems like it has bigger uh, flower heads too, but whether it's Baby Joe, Little Joe, they're both um, Joe Pie weeds, and they're not even supposed to be called Eupatorium anymore, they're changing the names on all that, but I still call them Eupatorium. Um, very nicely scented, very clean foliage, but just attract a, a, a whole array of pollinating uh, insects and, and, and butterflies. But it does give you a long season of bloom in your sun, clay, wet type garden area uh, through July, August, and even in September the dried seed heads look nice. So uh, be aware that this one is one that can seed itself like crazy. Crazy. So you're probably well advised to deadhead that. It'll also, if you deadhead those, you'll promote some some regrowth, rebloom as well. So might think about Joe Pie. So we, that takes us out of the the wet, low clay spots. If you got hot, dry soils and you got a client that wants you to, to try to use some natives, um, it's hard to beat our native eastern red cedar. Um, this has always been a favorite of mine, even, even the ones growing on the side of the road. I mean, we used to go and cut them down as Christmas trees, and 
Um, I just love, uh, and I like gin, so anything you can make uh, alcohol out of, it's, it's kind of fun that you can have a cedar plant and then go make some gin and go have a drink. Um, but there's lots of varieties of eastern red cedar, uh, Juniperus virginiana. Um, this particular one I think is, well, we planted this so long ago, I can't remember. I think it's Canardi. Um, Canardi has really nice blue um, berries, usually pretty heavy every year. It really attracts all kinds of beautiful songbirds. Um, you will get little babies coming up um, quite readily, but cedars are great for hot, dry, rocky situations. There's any number of great cultivars for eastern red cedar. Um, any of them I think are great depending upon what your customers are looking for. You can get them with silvery blue foliage and very soft foliage to more prickly um, uh, foliage. This the canard eye really has a nice darker green foliage and it's somewhat soft. Um, great, great fruit set, um, but they, there are cultivars with different habits. Um, another one that's more of a shrub form is gray owl. So if you don't have the room for an upright, gray owl is, starts out its life as a spreader and then eventually becomes kind of a, a, a semi-upright plant with a really, really broad base. So it's a kind of an unusual grower but beautiful kind of bluish gray fruit, makes great um, decorations at Christmas time and uh, very heavily scented, holds up well without being used in water. So we use it a lot for making reeds and things like that. So if you got hot dry, I know your customers might turn up their noses at talking about a cedar. Um, you kind of have to educate them and maybe you don't call them cedars and say that it's a beautiful juniper and they don't know that it's a cedar tree. Uh, especially when you show them the beautiful fruit and some of the more unusual and more regular growth habit. That's one of those things that when you tell them it's a cedar, they, people more often than not picture the really kind of unkempt, kind of crazy growing ones that are growing on the side of the road. These cultivars have been selected to have very nice uniform pyramidal um, shapes in most cases. If you do uh, uh, Virginia and Glocka, it's going to be a more kind of wild but very full and lacy kind of outline. Uh, so depending upon what you're looking for, um, it's going to have a very different look than what you see going up to uh, on I-64, I-75. This is a plant that just kind of popped up one day. Um, we had a display bed about 18 years ago in the back of our poly houses, and these were kind of thought to be temporary poly houses 20 years ago and they're still there. Um, we've kind of painted them to dress them up a little bit, but um, I'm not sure that the Caribbean motif is, is still what we're going to stick with this year. We might, we might, I think we need to change them a little bit now. But there was a perennial garden back here. That was before I realized how much work perennial display gardens were. Uh, if you don't have somebody dedicated to perennial garden displays or any display gardens as a matter of fact, it's really kind of tough to, to to maintain them. So there was this weird plant that popped up in, in some plant we probably got from Natorps or something a few years ago. Um, there's something weird that popped up in the middle of, I don't even remember what it was, it was probably a Joe Pie back there or something. And I just kind of let it grow and we got rid of all the perennials and turned this into a healing bed. But it was a few years before I realized that this was just a, a roos or a, a sumac. This one is Roos cup, uh, Copalina, um, flame leaf, or um, what's the other common name? Um, Shining Sumac. And this thing has been here in a dry bed for probably 18 years. It's about 20 feet tall, maybe 20 foot wide. It's, it's just awesome. It's one of my favorite plants for the fall. Very, very dry situation. You can see that the roots are kind of just trying to grow up above all the heavy or the gravel and everything that we have. And it really doesn't sucker the, all that much. Um, really not much at all. I, I kind of wish it would sucker some more so we can have some divisions to make some new plants. But um, it's a really neat plant with an extremely glossy leaf. Um, a nice uh, inflorescence here with the fruiting um, body, not quite as showy as your staghorn sumac, but, but, but quite, quite interesting, but it's the foliage and then the foliage in the fall that just turns bright reds and oranges. Um, really, really cool plant for hot, dry sites, um, and it can get much bigger than what you think. 
This is another one that's a native cultivar. Um, Hypericums or St. John's warts are very, very tough plants. You'll find them growing on the ridge tops, uh, really rocky, exposed sites. And this Hypericum frondosum as one of my favorites, just mainly because the flowers are bigger. This particular cultivar is sunburst. Um, this is a hard sell for most folks in the garden center. The, pot, the plants don't look very good uh, unless you've pumped them with, with fertilizer. Again, I told you we try not to do that. So if you let them kind of get weaned from the fertilizer in a pot, this plant is not going to look all that great. It's going to be kind of spindly. Foliage might ha have that lustrous kind of bluish green tinge to it. Um, so we have typically have a a lot of these sitting around the, the, the garden center by the end of uh, summer because we ha bring them in, they look pretty good in the spring. If somebody doesn't see them for that week or two that they're blooming with this really nice kind of um, frilly yellow flower, they don't bloom for all that long. So they're kind of sitting there. So about maybe four or five years ago, we had seven or eight of them. Um, sitting there and I'm going well nobody's gonna buy these and I needed some kind of little hedge that goes down by our in our way station our monarch way station wanted something that was generally neat and tidy preferably native because I was trying to go switch more to natives something with some some pollinator interest um, and then I was walking by those sunburst hypericum I'm like well this fits the bill I need to show people what these things look like and it will take hot dry gravelly soils it's a great native plant so we've got a little almost a formal hedge of about 10 of these I think I bought and brought in 10 yeah we planted 10 um, down there by inside the sinkhole on the drier edge of it and we decided to mix it with uh, butterfly milkweed and it makes a really striking combination when you've got that bright orange milkweed that also needs it hot dry and sunny with the hypericum um, so it's a really kind of cool combination for a hot dry site uh, and the other added, added benefit for this type of hypericum is it's semi evergreen in a mild winter it's going to hold on to a lot of its leaves so you might look at this if you want a shrub that's going to have a very relaxed but fairly neat outline getting maybe three and a half three and a half to four foot high and wide it's just a really cool native now when you move into dry shade that's one of the toughest things and it's hard to find good natives in, in my opinion for dry shade. Now Gene told us about some that are good for, na for dry shade. There's a lot of spring ephemerals that will do great in dry shade, but to have something that's going to be there spring, summer, fall, and maybe even into the winter, it's a little tougher. Um, so I typically don't go to my native handbook too often for dry shade. I end up using a lot of Chinese and, and Japanese plants that are more adapted, uh, Asian plants. And part of the problem with us in Kentucky is that the exotics are more adapted to dry shade than a lot of our more introduced or our, our native plants so the the uh, exotics are taking over our, our woodlands because they can handle the dryness and the and the shade a whole lot better but this is a native that's been I think really overlooked you can find it in a lot of nursery catalogs and things but it's not going to uh, be on a wish list of your typical garden center uh, customer or your landscape customer. But um, two years ago, I was looking for a native to fill a very dry, shady site, and I couldn't come up with anything until I started thinking about Dyer Villa. And unfortunately, it's called bush honeysuckle. So you've got the native folks that might not be familiar that there's a plant called bush honeysuckle, that if as soon as you utter the word honeysuckle, these people are look at you like th that you have no idea what you're talking about because everybody's been trained to say honeysuckle's a bad word. Um, but if you say Dyer Villa, they still might look at you funny too because nobody really knows what Dyer Villa is. But this is southern bush honeysuckle is the other n name, but it's a Native American plant. And this has performed very, very well in this extremely dry situation. 
Uh, I have used it in less dry sites. Uh, this one, I think this one is Butterfly. And you can find this one around, but I had never purchased, purchased it for the garden center. The only time I bought it was when I was like, oh, I need a native plant for super dry shade. I can't think of anything else. Let's try it. Um, it's really pretty good. Actually, I take that back. I did buy it for another job where everything was dying. And I was at my lap, you know, I decided to try it. And it's done really, really well in that site as well. Uh, this one I have been buying for four or five years. This is Cool Splash. And it's yeah, like, like Russ, my, ours has kind of reverted back and forth. But I've had, this one is one that's right up an extremely dry, shady spot right by our front gate. And it's been there. Was it there, Russ, when you were working with us five years ago? Six years ago? So it's probably, we planted it maybe right after. So it's been there maybe four or five years. And it's held up really well. We planted three of them. There's two of them still there, but it's under a lace bark pine. Super, super dry, no care. Really nice, clean foliage. So it's one that you might want to try, and it is a native cultivar um, of the southern bush honeysuckle. Paul, what's your experience with Dyerville at, at Udell? Uh, cool Splash has done okay. We see a reversion, like we already mentioned, occasionally. But like you said, nice variegation in a place that gets barely a drop of water. Does anybody have, uh, is it deer tolerant? Does anybody know that? We have lots of fencing. Okay. Well, this one is only, this has been in the same spot for about five years. It's about the same size as when we planted it. It's, it's two foot tall, two foot wide. So it's really not, now this other, the, um, the um, what did I tell you this one was called? <laughs> What is it? Oh, butterfly. Uh, this one's actually spreading quite nicely. I mean, this one was two by two and we planted it. Now this one's probably four by four. No water ever. Um, and this is what it looked like in the spring. I took some pictures a few days ago to just see if they looked any better. And actually, it still looks good. The foliage still looks nice. not as pretty as the spring picture. But um, I think it's, it's one I'm going to start to, to try to promote a little bit more. Um, this is one that I just picked up on the side of the road. Uh, going to Shaker Town um, about 10 years ago. This is just our native uh, Aster Cordifolius uh, Blue Wood Aster. If you're looking for something for dry shade with a little bit of color, um, this one is really a nice native aster. Now it will travel a lot, meaning that it seeds itself like crazy. So you've got to be aware of that. Um, you can, there is a, a, a period of time that you could go and shear this and get the old flowers off and not have all the seed. But I like the really fine texture of it all through the winter. And that's why I have lots of babies coming up. Um, but it does have this nice kind of light lavender blue um, flower. Very, very fine textured on arching sprays in different spots depending upon how much moisture. It might um, have just a few stems that arch up maybe three or four feet high, but in this spot close to our uh, uh, Montgomery Blue Spruce, it's very, very dense. I think we probably have sheared this one back a little bit, cut it back midsummer to keep it a little denser. Um, but you can have a pretty nice mound of, of foliage and flowers two by two if you, if you did a midsummer trim on it. Um, Really nice plant. Um, I've combined that plant with another native goldenrod. And people don't think of goldenrod as being able to be used in dry shade. So part of experimenting with natives, this is probably one of my, my best surprises uh, and trying to learn all of the different species of goldenrod. Goldenrod's a, a fantastic native plant family. You just have to know which ones to plant and which ones to avoid. There's a lot lot of terrible, terribly aggressive goldenrods that aren't worth the space that you give them because they'll fill up a space the size of the room. So you got to watch out for those. That's why I like this one, but until I've actually physically grown them and watched them, I couldn't tell you which one I'm seeing in the woods. There's quite a few. There's probably, at least in my limited experience with goldenrods, probably five or six that will do quite well in dry shade. But this is the one that I've had the most experience with. This is solid Dago erecta, or slender goldenrod. Uh, it's very upright, kind of reddish purple stems, really fine textured foliage all season long. And right now, 
Just took that picture like two days ago. Getting The blooms are just starting. Um, it's a very, very delicate look. It's not going to knock your socks off, but for those customers that really want to try natives and you got dry shade, this one is one to look for. It's very, very, um, uh, it'll end up growing, at least in this dry shade, under a, a fairly well-established willow oak. Um, four feet tall by probably three foot wide. Uh, and we've paired it with the, with the uh, blue wood aster. They're blooming right at the same time. This one blooms for about four to five weeks, as opposed to, I did a little survey, um, Google survey, based on the most popular goldenrod cultivars, because I was thinking, wanted to make sure I was growing the right ones. And one that's very high on everybody's list is very low on my list. Um, is fireworks. You hear a lot about fireworks goldenrod. I, I have a big planting of it in our meadow um, garden. It lasts for about a week. It blooms for about a week and then it's done. So at least when I was measuring the time period last year, it didn't last very long. Does anybody have fireworks that last longer than two weeks? Or is it pretty fast in, in terms of uh, yellow coloration? Anybody grow that plant or had really good luck with it? Nobody? Or, yeah, what's Tartan Aster? It's what? What's a Tartan Aster? Tartan Aster? Yeah, real, real coarse, large aster that could survive on a rock if you spit on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, we, I think we've grown, we've grown that one too, but the golden rods, you know, everybody's talking about them and um, a lot of people think they're the hay fever uh, source, but they're not. Um, but this one is one, if you've got the dry shade, try this one. It will seed itself quite readily too. So again, it's one that you need to cut back um, to keep it from taking over your, your, your garden. But if you've got a dry woodland edge or something like that where you want something that's going to naturalize um, readily, but this one doesn't have runners. It just spreads by seed. So it's not going to be one of these really aggressive rhizomatous um, goldenrods. Speaking of aggressive, um, you got to watch this plant, but in the right spot, uh, wood oats. Uh, I learned it in school as northern sea oats. I think the, 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 the more... Um, probably acceptable term now is calling it wood oats or river oats instead of calling it northern sea oats, but I still can't buck that. I still always will say northern sea oats, oh I mean river oats, oh I mean wood oats. You can find this growing anywhere in Kentucky along the Kentucky River dry shade, uh, full sun. I don't like this plant in full sun though, so I try to avoid putting it anywhere where it's going to just take over because every one of these little um, Sea, dangling little sea oats has at least a couple dozen seeds on it. So if you multiply how many little dangling oats you've got by how many seeds, you can have a, a, a takeover quite quickly, which in the right situation, it's fine. But where I like this, I've combined it here in this extremely dry spot with the bush honeysuckle. It's also a pycnanthemum here. And then down in this little vegetated swell, we got some fox sedge. So it's a little wet, wetter down here going up to very, very dry. Um, but we've packed a lot of plants in this area, and I think the river oats or the wood oats are going to not be too much of a nuisance there. But just be aware of that. Um, it is a very adaptable plant, gives you a lot of seasonal interest, and as long as you warn your customers about it, that they might have to deadhead, get rid of some of those oats, um, it should be very, very uh, popular. Just don't let it take over the world unless you need something to take over the world. Um, another, uh, Paul talked about some of the sedges. This one I think has several different names, but I like to go by Carex glauca because it is a blue sedge. This one is actually one we got from Pat back there. This is blue zinger. Uh, and this is kind of a hard sell for most garden center customers because it doesn't have the, the glitz of a lot of these other variegated plants and things. But for dry shade and knowing that it's a native, um, uh, American plant, uh, combining that with any of your hostas or Lenten roses. This thing has been really, really tough. Spreads not vigorously, not aggressively, but it gives you that nice kind of grayish blue foil on a plant that gets about 12 inches high, spreading slowly to probably 24 inches wide. Um, 
So look for blue sedge or blue zinger. Now we move into dense shade. Uh, dense shade is a real tough, tough situation because a lot of times you're dealing with shade that hardly anything will grow in except for amber honeysuckle. And once you get honeysuckle in there, it's, gonna, it's hard to get anything else. You've got winter creeper euonymus, English ivy, all these aggressive non-native plants, uh, garlic mustard, um, Poison ivy, which is a native, but you don't want it in there. Virginia creeper, which is a native, but those that's pretty much describes our woodland at Springhouse. Dense, dense shade, and that's all that was growing there. So we've done a lot of work trying to er eradicate amber honeysuckle, garlic mustard, winter creeper euonymus still keeps coming back. But if you want a native plant that will tolerate dense, dense shade, um, in our sinkhole at the end of our circle drive by our landscape office, um, I've been trying, had tr been trying to get pawpaws to grow for a long, long time. It's a hard one to get established. It's almost impossible to dig up a piece. At least I've never had luck with it. So I think it's best to start from small container plants. But these are finally taking over now in a very, very shaded uh, woodland area. Um, one of the things that's interesting, pawpaw is going to adapt from full blazing sun to full dense shade, and it's going to look completely different. Um, one of the interesting characteristics, when it's in full sun, those leaves are going to basically fold down like a, like a folded up umbrella because they don't want to catch all that sun. In the shade, though, they lay themselves out completely flat to try to catch as many of the sun rays as possible. So they're almost uh, horizontal to the ground. Uh, so really, really cool uh, situation there in full shade. Very. This was a picture two days ago, almost bluish black leaves. And if you are interested to see the flowers in the spring. You've got an interesting little uh, flower up here on the left hand side and then we've got a pretty good fruit set this year and the fruits are really um, interesting, really great for native wildlife, um, very high in potassium. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, if you've been to the field days at uh, Kentucky State, they've got all kinds of cool cultivars of, of pawpaw and they're looking into trying to extend the shelf life on them so that hopefully markets will be able to sell them someday. But they don't, they have a very short shelf life and we never get to eat our pawpaws because before they get ripe, we'll come in and all the branches will be broken going up. So all I can picture is a big heavy raccoon or a possum. So that's one of the problems at our place is that the branches all get broken because these animals aren't letting them fall. They're climbing up and, and kind of ruining the young branches on our trees. But, um, but we're in kind of a rural area, as, as John told you, we have all kinds of wildlife out there, but they love pawpaws. Another one that does well in full sun, full shade, and I love the adaptability of this southeastern native, uh, bottle brush buckeye. Now, of course, it won't bloom like this in full dense shade, but it will survive, it will grow. Uh, it'll give your uh, shade garden or shady spot uh, some interesting foliage. And if you get partial, this is a partial shaded situation. We get lots of flowers on our bottle brush buckeye. Um, but it's a great southeastern native plant for sun or shade. Again, it, it reacts very differently. If you've got it in full sun, it's going to be very, very dense and low. In full shade, it can get up to 10, 12 feet tall and be much more open and, and more like an understory tree, almost like what you'd expect from a service berry or something like that. It's going to be multi-stem and quite widespreading. So it's a great adaptable native plant. Another one that I've had really good luck with, and, and this is in full sun and full heavy dense shade. So these first three plants can go the whole gamut, but I like them in dense shade because there's so many, so few plants that you can choose from. Um, but calicanthus or Carolina allspice, um, 
wonderful plant. Now in the full shade, it's going to be much more darker green foliage, uh, but there's lots of cultivars of this. This is just a, uh, a one that's unnamed, but had kind of more of an orangey red flower. There's also one that was named by uh, Michael Durr, uh, Athens, which is the golden kind of yellow uh, flowered form. This is a great old fashioned American plant, wonderful fragrance in the spring, smells like strawberries, pineapples. How many of you all grow calicanthus? A lot of you growing it? Yeah. It's, everybody should be using this. If you've got clients that like old fashioned things, they might not really know this plant, um, but as soon as you show it to them and you break a branch or even break a, a tear a leaf off and kind of crush it, everything is fragrant on this plant. Um, very spicy, very aromatic. Not a whole lot of native uh, insects eat it, but I'm sure there's something that's out there that's pollinating and using the uh, the flowers and things. Uh, but it is a great uh, American native that you should look at for full sun, full shade. Again, in full sun, it's going to be, from my experience, it grows shorter. In the shade, it can grow up to cultivars, um, different cultivars can grow all the way up to six, eight feet tall. Um, and very bushy and quite full, even still in the shade. The last one on our list um, is one that's hit the mainstream, but very rarely do you ever see anybody wanting the smooth hydrangea. Um, this one is the one that normally, if we get this one uh, and it's labeled as an Annabelle or an Incredible, we send it back or we ask for credit uh, because most people don't want the, the native variety and sometimes they're mislabeled and the ones that are supposed to have the big sterile flowers like Annabelle, they just get mixed up in the trade every once in a while. Not as often as they used to, but you end up with not the big flowers and these very sterile, um, I mean very, um, not sterile, fertile. fertile, thank you. The fertile flowers, which is what all the insects and the native people want. Um, so it's kind of neat now that it's gone full, full circle, a plant that we used to throw away, now we actually are looking for and we're promoting it. Yes, G. So have you tried Hay Starburst yet, which is a lace cap form? Yeah, Hay Starburst is really cool. Yeah. And that's kind of a combination with some sterile, um, but many, many fertile flowers. And we did have that this year and had it in our native section and some of the, the more um, uh, adventurous native folks were buying that one because it has the similar characteristics but not going to be that big Annabelle type flower head but this one again from my experience seeing it in the woods in nature it grows in deep dark shade of course it won't flower very much but it still is a plant that will survive and give you some life in the shade the more light you can give it the more of these flat flower heads you'll get and you'll have all kinds of little pollinating insects um, again with more Sun, you'll have more insects, but if you're looking for some of these natives for some of these tough spots, you know, you might consider some of these. There's a whole lot more, there's a, a huge array of native plants. We've just scratched the surface. Just try to select a few for some of the toughest spots that we all kind of deal with on a, on a daily basis with our, with our own sites, with our own customers. Uh, hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight into some of the natives. And, but, but keep looking out there. Every time you go hiking in the woods, uh, going to um, native plant symposiums or gardens or things like that, be on the lookout for plants that have survived without any chemicals, without any fertilizer, without any uh, care from, from humans, uh, and try to match those same situations. If you're out in the deep, dark shade and you see a viburnum prunifolium growing, Remember that, hey, in nature it's growing here, so we should be able to translate that to our similar managed site. Uh, and likewise, if you see it along the side of a road in a ditch where it's staying wet and it's a native uh, plant growing there, remember that for when you're designing a rain garden or helping a customer with a wet spot in their yard. Um, that's how we kind of expand, uh, and maybe some of these are going to be on our, our next Theodore Klein plant awards because people are starting to talk about them, starting to ask for them. Um, and that's the other thing, if, if any of you can 
get your customers to start asking for some of these plants or if you all are in the landscape industry or the design field and you think these plants should be out there we will sell anything we will grow anything that we can sell and make some money on but it doesn't do us any good to have all these wonderful plants sitting there week in month in year in year out and they're sitting there they're great plants but nobody wants to use them or nobody's asking for them so we've got to get our customers and and our landscape people to start looking and asking for these plants so that guys like us that have retail operations um, will want to carry them because boy I'll, I'll sell anything except winter creeper euonymus I'm not going to sell that anymore uh, there's other things that we're just not carrying just out of general principle but um, but there's other things that we'd love to, to sell if people come in and ask for them so.